Hi, Jessica. Hi, Kate. How are you? Good. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I am so happy to have you here. And as I mentioned in the episode that we recorded with Kara in December, you are partnering with us this season so that we can do a reboot of Homeschool Sisters. So I really appreciate that. Absolutely. I couldn't think of anything or anybody I would rather partner with because when we first started homeschooling, you girls were the first podcast I ever listened to made me feel like I had partners in crime homeschooling. And so it felt like the perfect fit. That's wonderful. I, it was the first podcast I listened to too. (laughs) When Kara asked me to do it, I was like, I don't even know what that I've heard of them, but sure. (laughs) Why not? We can do this. (laughs) That's great. I love when, when you start off homeschooling and you see all of these people that you're like, oh, if we lived closer, we'd be friends. And you wish this person would be in my homeschool group. And then we all were online and formed this online community where a lot of us haven't even met in person, but we talk all the time. Yeah. It's crazy. I would actually even say that some of my best homeschool mom friends, like the ones that I'm the closest to, the ones at the end of the day that I'm going to call crying or screaming or elated with joy, I've never met in person, like the majority of them, because the community that we've built is just so strong. And how lucky are we that we are in an age where we can do that and not have to rely. I first started homeschooling. There's not a ton of people in New Hampshire. I look at some of the, some of my homeschool friends online and the communities that they have in different parts of the country. It's really, I was envious, but then you find your people online and you make it work. Exactly. We, while Florida is a larger homeschool community, the area we're in isn't because we live in the middle of nowhere. And so it's been very lucky, not just for me, but for Emily as well to be able to have, because some of the people that I became such good friends with, she's either talking to their kid on FaceTime, or some of them are even teaching her on out school. Every time I record a podcast, like today she pops on and says, hello. I know. So so fun. (laughs) It's like, she's even built the community as well. So it's not even just for us homeschool moms, but for our kids too. That's great. So I'm launching in talking to you because that's what we do. We were (laughs) kept having like false starts before we came on because we're just catching up, but I want to back up a little bit. And for anyone maybe who's new to the podcast, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your family and what made you decide to homeschool? Absolutely. So my name is Jessica Waldock from the Waldock way. I am married to Kevin and we have an only child, Emily, At the time of this recording, she is 10 and for all intents and purposes, fifth grade, if we're going to put a label on a grade, we have been homeschooling from the beginning, even though we did not intend or set out to homeschool. So Emily is our rainbow baby. She's my rainbow baby. And when preschool rolled around, the idea of sending my premature rainbow baby to preschool for however many hours it was going to be seemed like torture. Like I didn't want to have to drive the hour to the preschool and drop her off. And what was I going to do while she was there? And it just, it was too much. So I talked to my husband into it's ABCs. It's one, two, three. Anybody can do this, right? He's like, okay, whatever you want. And so I kept her home for preschool. And at the time he worked a job that required a lot of, a lot from him. He was on call. He was working 60 to 70 hours a week, late nights, weekends. So us homeschooling for preschool, even though that's still not even what we knew we were doing, allowed him to see her where he wouldn't have otherwise. Like I could keep her up late at night because we could sleep in the next morning or we could include him on a field trip whenever he was off versus it being during school hours and him having to miss out. So then when kindergarten rolled around, we were like, this is really working. Why are we going to change something that's really working for us? So we discussed at that time that we would reevaluate every single year, which we have never done since then. And it's just worked. It works perfect for our family. We absolutely love it. He has since come home and he is home with us full time now. So he helps homeschool her, which he loves. And he does all of the illustrations for all of our products for the Waldock Way. So we are all together at home pretty much 24 seven, working together, homeschooling together and just living life. One of the reasons why I was so excited to have you on this season is because you are homeschooling one child and we get a lot of questions. And one of our frequent flyer questions is for people who are homeschooling either an only child 
or perhaps like I'm in a situation right now where two of mine are off at public school now and I have one at home. It's a very unique situation. We were talking a little bit before coming on about how it's wonderful, but also there's a lot of talking (laughs) and there's so much more to it than just that. But that's just one example of how it is a very unique situation to have one student under your roof. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. And we had an episode that I'll link to in the show notes ages ago too, but just what's it like? First, I have to say it's funny because when we recorded that episode, I don't even remember how long ago. It's definitely been two or three years. Yeah. The thing that I kept saying most was no matter what your situation, if you're only homeschooling a single kid, you're homeschooling an only, whether that is because you're the grandparent and you're homeschooling or because you have some in public school and one at home, or we have a friend who has graduated one and only has one left, or me who actually only has one child and is homeschooling them. It doesn't matter. It's still your homeschooling only. And then I also kept saying that it's not easier. It's just different. Mm-hmm. It's kind of same because now fast forward all these years and you're in this situation. And like we were talking about, it's in some ways it can be easier because you don't have the sibling squabbles and stuff. But in other ways, it can be hard, harder, because there's so much talking. And it's, <laughs> for me, it's not just the talking. It's don't get me wrong. It's wonderful. If you, I want to preface that because if you're listening, thinking, can I homeschool only? You absolutely can. Like you can do it. You can be successful at it. Don't let anybody. What about socialization? It's really not that big of a deal. If you feel like homeschool is the right choice, don't let anybody sway you. Just do it. But it also don't let families of multiples convince you that your job is easier because it's not, it's different in the sense that you are the only person there and you have to listen to all of the talking (laughs) and you have to do all of the things. If they want to play a game, there's nobody else. It's you. Unless you get single player games, which we have tons of because that is a sanity saver if you're homeschooling mm-hmm. an only child. Or if you have a Mr. Pancake. <laughs> yes, or if you have a Mr. Pancake. We have Biscuit in our house is our Mr. Pancake, which are the imaginary friends that play games with our kids. Yes. <laughs> when we're like, I just can't right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you know what? Biscuit really wants to, they, she, he called me. He really wants to play. Please go play with him. <laughs> it's, I think while it's important for all homeschool parents, mom or dad, I think it's really important for one's homeschooling and only to find something, some sort of space or some sort of time that can be yours because of how you are entertaining your kid all day long. And because of all the talking and all the things for us, that's lunch. Like she knows hands down lunch is a do not talk to mom time. We sometimes sit at the table together and we both have headphones or earbuds in. she's listening to an audio book and I'm listening to a podcast. And sometimes I put her in front of the TV with a documentary or an educational show. And I don't feel guilty about it at all because that 20 minutes of silence makes me a better homeschool mom the rest of the day or better mom the rest of the day. I don't lose my cool with her because I've had 20 minutes of quiet to recharge and I can finish the day out strong. So I think that's probably my number one tip is if you are homeschooling it only find something, carve out some five, 10, 15 minute slot somewhere. And don't feel guilty about what you have to do to get that time. I can relate. It's on the one hand, it's so nice having the one-on-one time with him and it's been really great. And he gets to explore fully his own interests and not sometimes we're doing things because we're all interested in this one thing. And it's something that works for everybody. But for him now, if he's really into history, he can just do a deep dive into history. But on the other hand, it is so very much talking and we're both introverts. And you, I was likening it in a way I was describing it to my husband. It's almost like when you had toddlers and they talked so much all the time and to you, like to the adult. And I feel like it's a more mature version of that, but it still feels as an introvert (laughs) that like that so much talking where you just want to be like, shush. So I'm, I'm doing, he's, he does Xbox in the afternoon when he's done all of his work and I'm going to reinstitute we're like reading time and we're not going to talk like you and I are just going to take our book. Remember when your kids first gave up nap and you instituted quiet time? That's what you need. I need quiet time (laughs) back again. (laughs) Do you remember? You can either take a nap or you can have quiet time. Either way, it's a don't talk to mom time. It's like we used to have one hour and we had those sleep clocks. And I'd be like, you cannot come out until that light is green, buddy. 
yes, <laughs> unless it's an that, emergency. You need that yeah. again. <laughs> and you'd hear them like bouncing upstairs. Like you knew they weren't asleep, but it's just, yeah, that's relatable. So I know there's no typical day, but what does an average day look like for you? And do you have a particular philosophy that you follow? An average day follows, well, I guess that depends on the season because our rhythm or routine changes with the season. Like right now it is very much survival. But if we're going to go for the majority, it normally looks like Emily waking up before us or at least before I'm human. And I typically try to strew something, which is just leaving something out. I think that she'll engage with some on some level. So single player game puzzle, it might be a workbook that she's into. It might be some new apps on her tablet, something she's shown interest in that maybe we're not necessarily studying in our homeschool currently. And She'll do that until I'm basically ready to do morning basket with her, which is us just sitting down and me reading aloud while she does something quiet. And then we always close out our morning time by playing a game because that's like a really easy way for me to get her to the table. Like it's one of her favorites. So I can just lure her like, Hey, let's go to the table Mm -hmm. and play this game. And then we do whatever table work we're going to do that day. And our table work looks very different because we are much like you and we are either curriculum dabblers or we will just wing it. So it could be us writing thank you letters for presents, or it might be us doing a math lesson. It could be us baking something that day, whatever, you know, we're doing that's structured happens during table time, whether it happens at the table or not, because very often Mm -hmm. it's not at the table. Then we have lunch. And then we do some sort of afternoon activity and that can be a subscription box. It could be poetry tea time. It might be her doing something with Kevin while I work or vice versa. It just depends, but we try to save because I've had that rest time. Mm -hmm. Normally I'm like more alert and can follow directions and listen to all the talking and can engage a little bit better. So most of our hands-on activities or things that involve a lot of mental power for me happen in the afternoon. And then just the typical stuff that you do, like dinner and bed and bath and all that stuff in the evening. So do you do any sort of outside class or online learning or co-op type of things? We don't do co-ops. We tried when she was younger and we lived too far and they expected too much. It just, we weren't getting out as much as we were putting in, didn't feel like. So we quit doing those. Now she does take a zoo class at our, I say our local zoo. Again, it's an hour away, but she does that once a month. And she loves that because she loves anything animal. And then she takes online, like out school. So here's another reason this technology is so awesome. She takes a Lego class and a book club. The book club is once a month. And then the Lego class is every other week. So most of the time it works out so that it's one thing a week because of the way that's like once a month and every other week. And that's what I try to do as a mom of homeschooling only is to have her have some kind of, I hate, I even hate using the word socialization, I know. Some, some kind of interaction with peers, with people outside of adults or me and Kevin about once a week. So if I notice that maybe like over the holidays, classes were canceled because of the holidays, I'll say, okay, let's schedule a play date or let's schedule something because I like to make sure she's engaging with people other than us approximately once a week. What has surprised you most about homeschooling? Honestly, how much I enjoy it. If you had told, and how much I've learned too, but if you had told me like 10 years ago, not only are you going to have a rainbow baby and then you're going to keep her home and homeschool her and you're going to also make a living in the homeschool world, I would have been like, no, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure I'm going to send her to school and use that time to enjoy myself or do something for me. But I haven't. I absolutely, I have my days. We all do. But I absolutely love homeschooling. I love the freedom and the flexibility of it. I love that we get to follow her lead. She loves animals so we can go all in on that versus forcing her to learn about something that maybe isn't going to be something she's even going to need in the career she chooses. And I love that I get to learn not, or not that I get to teach her, but that I get to learn alongside her because I have learned more in the short time that I've homeschooled her than I learned in all of my years of formal education. That is so relatable because I didn't set out to homeschool either. One of my biggest concerns early on, because we were just dropped into it, was that we would drive each other 
a little bonkers being around each other all the time. He was just, a, he was a lot at that age. He was just challenging kindergarten, first grade, but it was so much fun. And the learning I did well in school, but it's totally different when you're exploring things that you are interested in the moment and you're curious about versus when it's presented to you as something, this is what we do in fourth grade. This is what we do in fifth grade. So it's just been so fun to learn with the kids. I agree with you so much. I remember I went in saying that, Kevin, you're going to have to teach history because I hated history. I remember vocally, I hate history. I hated everything about it. But actually, it's one of my favorite things to teach now. And it's because it's not that I hated history. It's that I hated the way it was taught to me, right? Like what you learn in fourth grade, this is what you learn in fifth grade. Whereas now it's, oh, we're interested in this. Okay, how can how is the history of this tie in? We were we're reading a book currently that's about a dog who was a bomb sniffing dog and ends up having an accident and then somehow turns into a seizure dog. And that led us down the history of like service dogs, which then of course led to, there's one called Sergeant Stubby, who was like a dog in World War I, like an actual dog. And then Balto and all of a sudden, this one book that we were reading has led to all of this history. And I loved every minute of it because it wasn't forced down your throat. It was like, you had an interest and you were curious and you just kept peeling back the layers and learning more and more. And I absolutely love that. I feel like not only we as adults, but definitely as kids too, you learn when you're interested and you retain it so much better. I love that you did history with dogs. It's amazing. And I feel the need to tell you that we were just talking in Neverboard Learning about geography because our theme this month is geography. And so I was asking, because they're super creative group, I was like, what are your favorite geography resources? Because I want to make sure I include it in the playbook when it comes out. And one of our members was talking about, and I wish I remembered the title now, I wasn't prepared to talk about it, but there is a book that is the geography of dog breeds, like where each dog originated. Oh, that is super So cool. you might need to find that one. I might need to find that. <laughs> <laughs> we love dogs here. I'm campaigning for a puppy, which I know is bonkers to do in January now in New Hampshire, but I was like, I should get that for the kids. So I'll get the title and send it to you. I definitely you know. need to add that to our lineup as much as, because it was just, it was so fun. It was one of those things that, and I love those times too, like where you have no actual goals or no plans, right? Like we're just reading. Cause in January, that's all we do is we read a book and we play a game. That's like bare minimum homeschool for us because it's horrible <laughs> weather and we're all coming back from the holidays and it's just, it's easy. Like what two things do we enjoy the most books and games? That's all we're going to do. And so we are, we're reading this book and it's called Stella is the book that we were reading and playing dog games. And as we we're reading, it was like, oh, don't we have another book that's like real life animals that like have made history. And so we went through and we page marked all the dog ones and we were reading them and Sergeant Stubby that's real has a hundred years after his time, they made an animated am or an animated movie about him. And so then of course, Amazon prime had it. And so then like for family night, we're watching Sergeant Stubby on Amazon and learning about world war one. Like that was not at all what I had planned when I was like, all we're going to do, because I can't, I'm not capable of more is read a book and play a game, but somehow that's where we ended up. I love that. Perfect rabbit trails. And it's a perfect example of how subjects overlap because she's so interested in animals that it makes sense to be learning about dogs, but then you're learning about a dog in world war one or a dog in world war two, you are getting, or the Iditarod, not the Iditarod, but the, the flu. The one in Alaska. I can't think of yes. what it is, but yes, <laughs> or the Balto story, the Balto. And what was the other dog? starts with a T. I was sick for two weeks and my brain is just not firing normally, but we read that book and watched a documentary or a movie. And that was so intense and so good. And my kids talk about it all the time. And it got them interested in the Iditarod, even though Balto didn't start the Iditarod, but I think some of that root overlaps a little bit. Yeah. That's and fascinating. It's always so much fun to me and to watch their like little brains make the connections. It's that is actually probably my favorite hands down part of homeschooling is watching the little like lights come on as the connections are being made. It's so rewarding. So Kara and I always wanted to stay very transparent and very real and authentic. And we don't for any minute want people to think that our homeschools are all sunshine and rainbows. What is 
the most difficult part of homeschooling for you, would you say? Math. Emily is 100%, like hands down, a linguistic child, like reading, language arts, even science and history, because those come so easily from just a read aloud. I find those very easy. And math is, but it is the biggest challenge in our homeschool. It's constantly, I'm having to be very creative. I'm having to search the most for games that will fit whatever concept I think she should be learning. It's the biggest struggle, the biggest headbutt that we have. It's getting better as she's getting older because I can just be more honest. Listen, I'm sorry, but math is, you have to have math. So let's find the least difficult way to get this done. But it is probably hands down the biggest struggle in our homeschool. And also because I don't know why math is the one thing that we as homeschool parents get hung up on too, but it's like, both. Like every time I have like a freak out moment, it's always math. It's never anything else. And that's the one thing she struggles with the most. So that's like the hardest thing is trying to be like, okay, you would totally be fine with nothing but read alouds for every other subject. Why are you being so difficult about math to myself? And okay, how can we be more creative? It's such a balancing act of trying to balance all of that and then struggle with her to get the math done. (laughs) Yes. We have had math be a pain point in our homeschool almost every year with different kids for different reasons. So I can relate to that. I think part of the challenge is too, depending on how you were taught. I was taught math. Nobody really explained why you did things. Just this is the way you do it. This is long division. This is X, Y, Z. And you study for the test and you've memorized all of that and you do well, but then you don't have the language to explain if a kid is having trouble with something, I'm always like default to, but that's just the way you do it. (laughs) See, and that's my problem. I was taught math the same way, but I'm really good at it. I never struggled. You're doing it. And I'm like, and she's looking at me like a deer in a headlight. And I'm like, I don't know why you don't understand this. What is the problem? (laughs) Because I don't have any other language to explain it, that you just do it this way. But yet I also don't understand because I've never been in her shoes, not understanding it. Like it's just, it has definitely been a pain point. I will say since Kevin has come home, he is not as good at math. Like it was the same thing with me and him. When we took college classes together, I had the same pain point with him if we're being honest. So it's not just Emily. It's apparently me. I don't teach math. (laughs) So since he's come home, he will be like, you get like, we we do a one try. And then she just reverts to can daddy help me with this? And I'm like, yes, he can. Like, I don't even feel guilty about it anymore because I'm like, this is going to result in one of the two of us either raising our voices or crying or walking away. So the minute she kindly says, can daddy help me with this? Yep. And I just walk away. So it's becoming less and less of a pain point because it's becoming less and less of my problem, but it's definitely feels like that's the only thing that has been like the consistent struggle in our homeschool. Like you said, every single year for a different reason or a different concept or something. It's always math. I really liked how you said too, about how, as they get older, you reach a point where you can just say to them, I know you don't like this. It's, you don't have to love every subject. My youngest who is home with me now has always hated writing, has great ideas and could tell you so many stories, but when it comes to actually physically writing, we'll balk at it every single time. And now that he's older, I can say to him, I know you don't like it, but we have to do it. You write all the time in your life, just even like grocery lists and things like that. So you have to, and he's going back and forth with, is he going to go to the middle school next year? He's not sure. And it's giving him this motivation to do his writing more than in previous years, because there's this thought like, what if I end up in the public school? And what if I don't know how to do these things? (laughs) So if you are someone who is homeschooling younger kids and you're having those headbutting battles all the time over writing or the math page that you're asking them to do, it does get easier because you can reason with them and say, look, this it's just part of life. And you just have to do it and let's make it as pain-free as possible. And when reasoning doesn't work, you can just always sink to the level of negotiation. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Do you really want to do this really fun thing or play the Xbox? You have to do it. Sorry, (laughs) it's just the way it is. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, the Xbox has been such a carrot. I know at some point that will wear off. We visited my niece and nephew in Colorado in March and they have an Xbox. So they spent a lot of time exploring all of the games and then had been saving up all summer both boys to get it. And I have one boy who's a saver and one boy who is not a saver. So they were supposed to get it in May. They had figured out was mathematically like when they would get it. And they just ended up getting it in November because basically one paid for the whole thing. But it has been, we have certain like chores each day, not a ton, but this is just what you need to do. And if you don't do that, you don't get the Xbox. So it's just, you do your school or your homework or your chores and all of that. And then talk to me about Xbox, but it doesn't come first. And it's just making life a lot easier. <laughs> over here. Well, here is to giving you good vibes that that lasts for a very long time. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so what do you feel guilty about not doing in your homeschool or what do you wish you could do more of? I think in this, is gonna, I know this is going to sound crazy to some people because I'm homeschooling and only, which means it's just me and her most of the time, like literally all the time, one-on-one, -on -one. but I still always feel guilty that I'm not spending as enough time with her. And I don't even just mean we're not spending enough time on math or we're not spending enough time on writing, but just in general, I feel like as a homeschool parent or as a person in the world, you're being pulled in so many different directions constantly. The laundry is calling you or the dishes, or you need to get a workout in, or you need to go work. If you have a job, if you're working from home. And I always feel like I'm dropping one of the balls. And unfortunately, that's always the easiest ball to drop. Like it's always the easiest ball to drop because you can say, oh, instead of me reading aloud to you today, I'll get it on audio. Or, oh, instead of me doing that game with you, here's a single player game, or here's a workbook that you can do independently, especially as they're a little bit older. So I feel like I'm constantly battling having enough time, not to homeschool well, but just quality time to dedicate to her and to homeschooling because there's so many other things vying for your attention constantly. I think that is going to be really reassuring for people to hear. Cause I think that's something that we all struggle with I completely relate. We had the holidays and I was under the weather. And so I dropped all balls, <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> the post holiday mess, plus just all the balls that have been dropped. So I can relate. I don't feel like I'm getting quality time in with anybody in the house right now because I'm scrambling to catch up. But even on a normal week, you still feel that way. I feel I might make a really good dinner, but then all the clothes still need to be thrown in or they need to be folded or we went for a really great hike but we didn't do this work that I was hoping we'd accomplish this week so I feel like that's constantly something that I think we all struggle with on different levels that is that's absolutely it I always tell Kevin I'm like I was a great homeschool mom today stunk at everything else but a great homeschool mm -hmm. mom or like I was a really great housewife made a nice dinner or I baked something, but I stunk it. Up. But I will say I had somebody tell me once. And when I do this, it's as balanced as life gets. And it's not often because sometimes I have to remind myself, but somebody told me once that the secret to life is it's a juggling act and you're going to drop one ball because none of us are great jugglers, but the secret is to not drop the same ball two days in a row. Ooh. So if you don't homeschool today, then that's the, the one thing you make sure that you get in sometime tomorrow. Or if you, you know, your house is a mess today, then that's what you make sure you do tomorrow. And I was like, okay, that's, and when I remind myself that, and I do it, we have the best weeks, but it, you still get in your head because it's still a constant battle of, I didn't do enough, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we lay our heads down and feel like we didn't do enough in some part of our life. Why do we do that? <laughs> Because we all know you can't do it all. We would need five of us to be able to. And the crazy thing is, if we, as homeschool moms, we are the more invested in our kids' education than anybody else is ever going to be. Their education from us is going to end up being better than it would have been anywhere else, private school, public school, whatever. Yet we still are constantly feeling like we're not doing enough. It's bananas. I'm going to talk about this on a different episode, but having two that are in public school, my daughter told me that public school is way easier. And I don't feel like I'm a really tough teacher <laughs> making them do a million things. I feel like we're pretty laid back. So it was funny to hear that. And the kids are fine. You're doing better than you think you are, is I think 
what we're trying to say. Yeah, <laughs> even exactly. even though we are all struggling with our self doubt and I should have done this and should have done that, we're at the end of the day, we're doing better than we think we are. What is one word that you would use to describe your current homeschool year? Oh, that's a tough one. That is like current as in like the 2022, 2023 homeschool year. Yeah. Hmm. That's going to be a compound word. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Fit in as many as possible. (laughs) I'm going to have to go with interest led because I find like the more we've homeschooled, the longer we've homeschooled. And especially now with Kevin being home, because he was, oh, buddy, when we first started homeschooling, first, I'm going to preface, my husband is 20 years older than me. So he came from the generation of, if you didn't have physical proof, you didn't do it. So I was much more open-minded than he was. And I remember when we first started homeschooling in kindergarten, like he would come home from work and expect papers on the table. Like, what did you do today? I need to see the proof of what you did. And then it, he lightened up as the years went by, but now that he's home and he can see like physically, he's here seeing all of the connections and all the light bulbs, whether there's physical proof or not, we are becoming more and more interest led. And we are letting go more and more with each year because it's like, we don't need that anymore. We don't need that. But even though when you first start out, you're looking to all of these people because you're clueless, right? So you're like, oh, I'm going to use that for that for geography and that for math, because they said that, and you end up with all this stuff that worked for other people. And then slowly, the longer you homeschool it's I don't need that. That didn't work for me. Do we really need to do this? No, because we can read a book and go down all these rabbit trails. You don't need all this stuff. And so I feel every year we get closer and closer to that and we do more and more of it. And this year, I feel like we finally are like, we're there. We've always made an effort to be interest led. But this year, that's definitely where we're at. It's pretty much everything we even create for products is based around her interests. So I love that so much. And wouldn't it be great if we could just start off like that? Because we start homeschooling because either we don't want our kids to go to public school for that model, or it wasn't working for them, which was our case. It just didn't fit the kid. And we try to recreate what other people are doing that's very traditional school-like, which doesn't make sense because you're not putting them in school because you either don't want to or it's not working. But then we do that. And I know I have so much curriculum here that was something that someone else loved and recommended that was a total flop. We won't even talk about the state of my office. Kevin even said just a few days ago, we really should even just rehome somebody who it would be a better fit for because we have no more room for all Mm -hmm. of the stuff. You're not going to use it. She's six years past it now. Why do you (laughs) still have it? Because I might need it one day. Who knows? And because you paid for it and it's painful. It's painful to have something show up and use it for a couple months and have it not work. And then the weight of the fact that you paid for that. And if you've done that repeatedly. (laughs) Yeah. I have a a Facebook group that I admin recently. Somebody said something like, how do you either repurpose or, you know, accept the fact that you've spent, we'll just say hundreds. I don't remember what the number Mm -hmm. was of dollars on something that very much so doesn't work. Like you've pushed it and pushed it. You've tried to recreate it. It didn't work. And I thought about that for a while and we discussed it. And I said, I think, cause I never, I mean, I felt guilty and I've held on to a lot of it, but I think I was just like, I chalked it up to that was the cost of the lesson that we learned. Like we learned what does and doesn't work for us. And unfortunately the cost was buying the curriculum and suffering through to know this doesn't work and this isn't going to work, but you're right. I did the same thing. Kate, when we decided to preschool, like homeschool preschool, we have a addition on our house, which is our homeschool room. Like I'm talking primary colors, ABC is on the wall. Like when people would visit us, they were like, do you run a preschool daycare? (laughs) <laughs> no, I have one kid, one kid. Not only did I recreate what they did, like it looked like a daycare, like a preschool in a kindergarten, because that's all I knew. I'd had no other examples of what it was supposed to look like. And you know what? Here's the thing. It's not supposed to look like anything, but you don't know that going in. I know. And at the beginning too, you don't trust yourself and you don't have that gift of hindsight because so much of it is just, it's a crapshoot, right? You're like flying by the seat of your pants and 
you are hoping that it works, but you don't know. But then as you keep going, you have all of these wonderful moments where you're like, oh, gosh, they learned that so well, or look at how far they've come. And they used to not be able to do that. And now look at them, but you don't have that in the beginning. So you're just got all your digits crossed and hoping for the best. And there's always that fear that aunt was going to ask them something at Thanksgiving and they're not going to know the answer. Or one of the times the Olympics was happening, one of my kids was like, is Paris in New York? <laughs> no. The best is I have somebody in my family, a couple of people in my family who teach in the public school mm -hmm. and they always not out of being inquisitive, but out of trying to have a conversation with Emily, she homeschools. They will ask her like when they're around, what are you learning in school right now? And it kills me because every time she's like, we're not doing school. And she just like walks away. We don't do school. What are you talking about? We don't do anything. And part of me wants to bury my head in the sand. Oh my gosh. I can't believe she just said that. But the other part of me is also who, what we're doing doesn't count as school to her. She just thinks we're having fun. Like we're reading books and playing games and that's what life is for her. So it's that double-edged sword. Oh my gosh, please don't ask for anything. But then also, you know what? It doesn't really matter. Like obviously something that we're doing is working because it doesn't feel like school to her. I could relate to when you said that Kevin would come home and want to see papers. Cause I remember my husband coming home so many times and saying, Hey, what did you guys do today? And my kids just look at him and say nothing. <laughs> like, do anything. So much. What do you mean? Nothing, but you're right. It's a, it's, it's a good thing because they're not seeing it as work. It's not this concrete. We learned about the declaration of independence today. And I wrote down this worksheet and we discussed this. That's just a fluid whatever they're interested in and weaving other things in. And as you go on, you just get better at that because you just extract the education from the school, I think. Yes. And I, you learn to trust yourself. You do 100%. And I will say, I think having more, I hate even using the word influencers as well, but having more real down to earth influencers, I feel like has helped because like I said, homeschool sisters was the first podcast I listened to. And I remember it being the thing that like, okay, like you can do this. They say you can do it. <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons like that, not only just that, but that's why like I even started doing a YouTube channel because I felt like I wanted to show more of the fact that it doesn't have to be because you, you saw it. How many of those COVID homeschool schedules did you see going around in 2020? that were 110% unrealistic. Oh my gosh. I made one that was I not, yours was so realistic. I got so many angry emails from people who I think this were in public enough. school. This isn't enough. Who were in this public school enough. that were like, God help your children. That's all you're doing during the, but we were in a worldwide crisis. The entire world was shut down. There was no classroom out there where someone was excelling but, because but it even, just- even in the perfect of circumstances, though, those schedules that are pretty, right? They're color coded and they're pretty. So they circulate well. Perfect mm -hmm. homeschool room, the perfect game school shelf, like they circulate really well. So it feels like that's all you're seeing. Like you're constantly only seeing the highlight reels, right? And that's what you're comparing yourself and your homeschool to. But realistically, even myself included, it's a lot easier to post like Emily doing something versus us having a conversation that might have led to more learning than the worksheet. I mean, like even right. it, it's hard to quantify it, to even share it, which is why I find so much value in podcasts like this and sharing more real because you can't always take a picture and put it on Instagram. And a lot of times, like the hard part of your homeschool, you have to also understand that it involves children and your children don't necessarily want you airing their current struggles <laughs> or putting Instagram. pictures of them crying over you know, writing or math. This is how math's going to, nobody wants to see that. And People it can might be, want to see it, but your kid doesn't want you posting it. It can be really hard to be authentic online. And I can remember like during COVID, we had a lot of anxiety happening. My husband was working directly with it. And we honestly, that whole year, mostly hiked. <laughs> if you followed us on Instagram, we were hiking and we were not doing math and we were not doing any of the other things. Our whole goal, some days we just spent the entire time out in the woods was just to alleviate anxiety and they're okay. They're doing fine. You know what I mean? It's, it doesn't need to be, you can take a year off really 
in some ways and do fine if you trust, just have conversations and read books. And the only thing that we did structured in the year of COVID was I had created a holiday fun around the, I had created a winter holiday, so but fun. Then we expanded it to a holiday, a year of holiday fun. And that was it because I was like, if any year ever needs more celebrating, it's this one. So we, that's it. That's all we did. We celebrated or observed celebrations from all over the world. And we went full out. We had a pinata for Cinco de Mayo and we sent lanterns up for Diwali and we threw colorful packets of powder at each other for so fun. And But that's all we did. That's it. We didn't focus on math or reading or writing. We just observed and celebrated the holidays because I was like, if any year needs more celebration, it's this year. And you're right. Basically that would have just been what geography, all we were doing was that. Then all we did that year was geography. All you did was nature study. Mm -hmm. Obviously more things happen because you're having those deep conversations and you're going down those rabbit trails, but did I push it? Nope. That was the year of survival. We were just trying to get to the other side. Exactly. That was such a tough year to think about in retrospect too, because so many people were reaching out. So many of my public school friends, I felt terrible. Like they, they wanted me to provide them with some easy answer. This is what you can do if remote learning isn't happening for your kids. But I was you like, I'm, do nothing. I'm drowning. No, nobody Everyone was like, aren't you used to this? I'm like, this is not home. This is not normal homeschooling. No, it was <laughs> no. I'm like, you just need to do nothing. And they would be like, that's not an option. I'm like, that's all I've got for you. We were just like, let's focus on the heart. And then the head will be fine after. Yes. We just need to survive this. Absolutely. (laughs) But they did. They learned other things naturally. We're very fortunate to live someplace with trails right near us. And so they got the map and they hiked the whole, the trails, the nature center had a challenge. If you do this whole trail system and show us what you did, you get this neckerchief. And my boys are all into neckerchiefs because that's a scout thing. So (laughs) that was what we did. And they would chart it and they ended up making graphs and stuff on their own about how many miles. Some days we did like eight miles of just wandering for many hours. And all of the things they saw during that and all the nature that we witnessed, seeing an actual porcupine when you're out walking, things, seeing a moose. And we were fine, but it was just, it was so funny and not funny during that time to see all the Pinterest beautiful homeschool schedules that you should follow and then be like, but no. <laughs> But, it, but totally. Why are we pretending it's normal? This is yeah. normal. But that's what it's what you, it's not just because that's what, that's only what's being put out. It's just, that's what is attention grabbing. It's colorful and it's pretty. And it's like, oh yeah, this is it. This is what I need in my life because nobody looks at a schedule or a blank piece of paper and goes, that's what I need in my life. I need no schedule. I need a blank piece of paper. Nobody looks at that and thinks of that. We look at it and we think, oh, this is going to fix everything. This will make it better. But it it doesn't. And it's like I said, it's hard to take pictures of things that aren't quantifiable and share them. So you're not seeing the things that even sometimes mean the most, mm-hmm. the deep conversations or because I bet beyond just what you saw on the trail, like the conversations you had in Huge. eight miles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can't photograph that and put that on Instagram. Yeah, no, there's no way to quantify that. And going along with that, but switching gears a little bit, you have a store in the wall duck way that has products that are what your family is doing, which is what I love because it's real life. So you're taking actual interests and things that you're doing anyway, and then you're generously sharing it with the homeschool community so that they can do the same thing to learn how to joyfully follow curiosity and rabbit trails and how you can take one interest, whether it's Harry Potter or Bear grills or whatever, and make an entire unit study around it where you are covering every single academic area and you also include games. So when someone knows what they want, like you're saying now this year feels so much better than previous years, you're where you wanted to be years ago. Somebody knows I want to follow rabbit trails and I want to cover all the subjects, but that just feels overwhelming because maybe it's their first or second year, or maybe they have a whole gaggle of kids or, you know what I mean? Any number of things, or maybe they work from home and they don't have a lot of time to assemble a unit study because it is super time consuming. Could you talk a little bit about how that got started and some of the resources that you offer? Sure. 
So I think one of the things that's funny is it really has always started with Emily. It first began when she was somewhere in around the five to six year old age. And we devoured the Magic Treehouse series and just devoured it. Like she had the backpack. She was Jack one day, Annie the next day. My husband even built her like a little fort near a tree so she could have a tree house. It was an obsession. And we were doing school and I'm like, towards the end of kindergarten, I think, hey, what do you want to do next year for school? You just, you know, what you're supposed to do as a homeschool mom. I had no intention of probably actually doing it at that point, but I asked and she looks at me dead serious. I want to do Jack and Annie school. And I'm like, okay, all right. I don't think so. <laughs> the more I got to thinking about it, the more I'm like, oh no, wait a minute. We can do this. Those books cover a huge amount of topics. You've got dinosaurs, you've got ancient Egypt, pirates, ocean, space. I could go on. There's 37 books. There's tons we, of We topics. had the same obsession. That was such and, a fun. And they have the nonfiction companion for every yes. story. Yes. So I was like, I can actually do this. And at the time, I'll be honest with you. I didn't even know what a unit study was. I mm-hmm. totally I had no clue what a unit study was. I had never at that point done one of the what style homeschoolers. Like we were just trying to do, do whatever was working. And so I just started creating naturally what seemed to work. Like book one was dinosaurs. So we watched dinosaur videos on YouTube. We played dinosaur games. We read dinosaur books. We went on a field trip to the museum to see dinosaurs. Like that's what we did. And then I just kept doing that, but I was keeping a log. And posting on Instagram and Facebook and people were like, what curriculum are you following? I'm like, I'm not following one. So by about halfway through that year, people were asking me to the point that I'm like, okay, I could probably compile this, right? I can compile what we're doing. So at the end of that school year, I released the very first one, which was Passport to Adventures, because that's what Emily wanted. And it's essentially turns each of the Magic Treehouse books into a topic-based unit study an entire year long. And then as time went on, the next thing she wanted was, mom, wouldn't it be fun to spend a whole year at Hogwarts? So Waldox, Wizards and Wands was born and we spent a year at Hogwarts with that unit study. And it's funny because I've had people ask me, hey, what's your next unit study coming out? Or what's your next, what's your schedule? And I'm like, I don't have one. And I would love to be able to tell people like, this is what's coming in 2023, but I don't have one because I am constantly making to Emily and her interest. And honestly, that's the one thing I've always prided, prided myself and our company on is that we're making what's into her and then sharing it, not making to the masses. If your kid is also interested, then what, this will work for them. If your kid loves Bear Grylls, we have a survival unit study because she went through a huge Bear Grylls and survival obsession. We just did Percy Jackson and Greek mythology. There are so many different topics that we've gone through over the years. Kevin came home. He does all of the illustrations for them. He And they're amazing. He was an artist. And I told him when we first got married, I'm going to find a way one day for you to make a living doing art. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that this is the art he would be doing, but he loves it. And Emily enjoys what she does because it's her daddy's art twice as much. Like she would never have colored a coloring sheet before, like ever. She hated coloring but it's daddy's art. Like she will color it because it's not childish and it's not just a coloring page and it's daddy's and it's been amazing. So all of our unit studies are multi-sensory, multi-sensory because that was always huge. Emily happens to be an auditory learner, but I'm a big fan of just appeal to all the senses because then you just get it in there more. So we have YouTube videos linked. We have books linked. We have printable games in there because if you're buying a digital curriculum, you may be in a part of a country where games are ridiculously expensive. Even here in America, everything's gone up. So I always make sure to include two to three printable games that you can play during that study. Sometimes, most of the time, there's some sort of trivia because there's some sort of way like that I want you to be able to review what you learned without a test because I'm not, and I try not to include a ton of busy work. So there's always activity pages but not busy. Like it's stuff that you can do that's fun and hands-on. There's always some sort of experiment or project. Like I said, they just are topic-based and try to appeal to all the senses and make learning as fun for kids as possible. And I started doing it because I realized it comes naturally to me. Like I can sit down and say, these are all of the things we could do with this book or this topic. And it doesn't It's like you said, it's not easy and it doesn't come naturally to everybody. And I thought, then this is just what I'll do. I'll just share it with the world. It's perfect. And like you said, it's such a testament to 
honoring the child because you're sharing what worked with your kid. And we've used a bunch of your products, the magic tree house, we had outgrown. I I wish Emily was older than my kids, (laughs) but I have seen it. And my oldest, all three of them, but my oldest was the most Jack and Annie obsessed would have eaten that up like in a second. If you were like a Jack and Annie kid, it's just amazing, but almost 15, (laughs) he doesn't do that anymore. Could you talk a little bit about, do you have, do you have anything in the works coming up? We do. So Emily really is like one of those kids who comes spring really wants to get in the dirt and get outside and not do like school anymore because that's where we're all at come like March, right? Like we're ready to just throw it all to the wind and get outside in the great weather. And so I asked her like, Hey, this spring, what are you interested in learning about that maybe could get us outdoors? And she said, all things, creepy, crawly mom. So we are in the midst of working on what we're going to call a mini beast unit study. Cause I don't love the idea of creepy crawly. That's if you have kids that are like maybe afraid of mini mm-hmm. beasts or bugs. So that's what we're working on. And I will say that Kevin's illustrations are always really good, but I was telling you before we started recording, his are so good this time that like, for example, some of the bugs, when I was doing like the anatomy of them, I was actually making me itch. It is so <laughs> realistic and so good. I was like, you did too good on this, babe. <laughs> I have to tell you a funny story. Our town has a dump, like a transfer station, and it has a library. So you, when you drop off your recycling in your trash, you can check the library and see if there's any good books, especially when the kids were like teeny tiny, they would find books there and take them home. And some of them, we call them instant dump classics, <laughs> like <laughs> books that are not mainstream at all. And there was one that my oldest at three and four years old was obsessed with. And it was called Body Baddies. The, I think it's called the Hidden Creatures Living on You. <laughs> Ew, no. And it, it is the most disturbing it has a guinea worm. I don't know if you know what that is, but don't Google it if you're squeamish. And he would ask anyone who came in our house, he'd be like, can you read a book to me? It, people always talk about that all the time. They'd come to the front door and he'd be there with like book under his arm. And it was for the longest time, it was body baddies. And I was like sitting there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that is hilarious. Watching people's reactions to it as they're reading, I was just like, I'm so sorry. Please come back to our house. Please still be our friend. I remember his, my father-in-law was like, this is disgusting. (laughs) But he was just like really into it in a thousand and one bugs to spot and all that bug stuff. Emily is very excited. She's already planning ant hotel and rotting log ecosystem and doing the butterflies because we do that every Mm -hmm. spring anyway. So she's planning all the things. So really what I should say is I do all of the like putting together work, but Emily does most of the planning. Mm -hmm. Emily plans, Kevin does the illustrations, and then I just put it all together. (laughs) I love it. And it's, I love that it's a family affair. And I always think about how when Emily is done homeschooling, when she's out in the world as an adult, that you have created this beautiful time capsule of everything you've been stunning. It's just so neat to be able to look back and be like, oh, I remember Jack and Annie school. I remember when we went to Hogwarts. I remember learning with Bear Grylls or traveling the parks. And it's just, it's what you're doing. It's really neat, I think. And I also love that our YouTube channel is going to do the same thing. I try to do a day in the life once or twice a year because I'm like, I, while she, the days in the life are not her favorite when we film them because she's the cameras on all, all day long. Mm-hmm. If you've ever done one, it's a lot of work. Like you're moving mm-hmm. equipment and you're trying to document. And it's a lot. And I might sometimes get a little stressed. And right. Cause you not, plan- yeah. And I'm not always the nicest. And anyway, so I'm like, but one day you're going to look back and you're going to be like, this is so cool that I can literally watch an entire day of what we did. Like for years. Yeah, it's like, it's like a time even capsule. better. Yeah. It's a, a, this amazing time capsule of how we lived and learned like together. I, it actually makes me tear up. Cause I'm like, I, it's making me, I'm so getting cool. chills. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. What you're doing is awesome. But so that's spring. What are you guys doing right now? So to right survive now, the worst yes. part of the homeschool year. So right now we are doing in January, we've done it. Oh gosh. 
I don't know. For as long as I can remember now, we started doing a book and a game a day. I literally remember thinking coming back from the holidays was the absolute worst. And even into February, sometimes depending on, it's not as bad here in Florida, but I know like for you, Mm. January and February are horrible if you're in bad weather. Mm. So coming back from the holidays, I challenged myself for a couple of reasons to just read a book and play a game a day. And now that she's older, it's not like a whole book. We do a chapter book and just read at least one chapter, sometimes more. But one of the reasons was I was like, what are the two things we love the most in our homeschool? And it's reading and playing games. What are the two easiest things reading and playing games? And then also what are the two things that I feel like lead to the most rabbit, like lead to those most natural learning, the things that happen themselves where I'm not having to plan or structure or dictate like where we can, like you said, just survive and that's books and games. And so I was like, okay, this is easy. And also sometimes as homeschool moms, we feel at least in August. And then also sometimes in January, we tend to see this fresh new year. Like it's this clean slate and we're like, Ooh, we can buy all the new curriculum and we can do all the things. And then you just came back from the holidays and it's winter and the days are shorter and the kids are not wanting to do it. And then you're frustrated because you've spent all this money and all this new stuff that you thought was going to be exciting. And so it also prevents me from doing that. It prevents me from trying to be like, let's add all of these fun things that I saw in. Instead, we're going to keep it simple and focus on connection. Like we're just going to read a book and play a game and then we'll follow wherever that leads. But normally we follow with maybe library books or YouTube videos, not like extra things and money spent simple. And so that is what we're doing right now. Me and Emily actually picked our books together this year, which we don't normally do. Normally I just pick the books and she picked, or we picked seven chapter books. Now I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but it was like a, just in case we'll have some extra We picked seven chapter books, which I have a YouTube video on. So I will send you the link. Oh, definitely. We go over. And then we picked a theme out of each of the books. So Stella, our theme was dog. So we played dog bingo and dog memory and top trumps. There's like a lovable puppies version, um, nuts about mutts. So all the, all the dog games that we had, we pulled all those. We're like, okay, that's going to be our theme for this book. Now, obviously it's a challenge that we invite people to do with us. It doesn't have to be themed. I'm just extra like that. It's the way my brain, (laughs) it's just the way my brain works. And now subsequently the way Emily's works too. If I did it and didn't theme it, she'd be like, oh my gosh, this doesn't work together. Mom with frog. (laughs) They're mismatched. Um, So it's, but it's just a way to encourage not only myself, but other people to just simply move into the winter and after the holidays and the slow kind of blah season of homeschool with things that bring you joy and things that don't require a lot of stressing on your part. Just grab any book and any game, let your kids pick, let them alternate picking and just do two things that bring you joy. And you know what, if games don't bring you joy, then just read the book. Like you can skip Mm -hmm. the game. I love it. And I'm a firm believer that reading the read aloud and the play are two of the best things that you can give your kids in your homeschool. Even if it feels like maybe you're not doing like enough. (laughs) I mean, that voice in your head that's, shouldn't I be doing the math workbook too? And shouldn't they be practicing this? I've had days where you feel like, okay, we've had the best homeschool day ever. Okay, maybe let me rephrase that. Where you feel like you've had the most productive homeschool day ever, right? You got the math done. You wrote something. You've got your essay. You've got geography. You did something. You did all the things. Like you checked all the boxes. But then when I think about what was, were our best, homeschool days. It's never the ones that were the super productive, always the ones that are like, Hey, we read this. And then we went down this rabbit trail. The next thing I knew we were watching this on YouTube. The next thing I know we're having a family movie night, watching this other movie, or we're out in nature looking for this bird that's in our area. Like what it's always those days, the ones where you just started with reading or playing or pretend play or something. It's always those days where you feel like you didn't do, and you didn't accomplish anything. Those are always the best ones. I agree. And it's all the conversations too, right? It's that non-measurable quantifiable thing again, before we go into the quick questions at the end, can you tell everybody where they can find you? You can find me on my website, which is the wall.way.com on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok as just at the wall.way. 
Awesome. So we're doing rapid fire this year. We're trying something new. And so I have a few questions for you. And the first is coffee or tea? Mm, Tea. I don't drink coffee at all. It's gross. (laughs) As I'm sitting here, I do both, but the coffee is has to be nature walk or documentary on the couch. Oh, nature walk up before the kids or let me sleep. Oh, let me sleep. 100%. Do not wake me up. (laughs) Video games. Yes or no. Yes. And what's bringing you joy right now? My Kindle, my Kindle Paperwhite. It's something that I never thought that I would ever like. People were like, oh, you need to get an e-reader. I'm like, oh, I I like a real book in my hand. And I still love a real book in my hand. But the convenience, like of being able to lay in bed at night and not have to have the book light hanging off the book, (laughs) disturbing my husband. And it hurts a lot less when you fall asleep and it slaps (laughs) you in the face. (laughs) which I have done multiple nights this week. And it doesn't hurt as bad when Kevin rolls over on it in the bed either. (laughs) Because I always fall asleep with it. And he's, I'm enjoying the Kindle versus the big giant hardback paper book. (laughs) Or hardback book, me too. (laughs) It sounds like my house, my husband, Kate, how do you fall asleep? Don't you realize that you're falling asleep? And I don't know what that is. Like I'll be reading and then I just wake up and I'm, I'm a stomach sleeper. So it doesn't fall on my face. I usually just, I'm sleeping instead of a pillow it's like your head is on the back candle. to my face yeah See, and I'm, I'm a back sleeper so it's like straight on the face I'm like and the other thing I really like and you're gonna get this too because you're a glasses person is I can change the font size so I can make it really big and then I can read without my glasses so I don't have to fall asleep with the kindle and my glasses on oh my gosh without yeah waking up with glasses stuck to your face is not fun I I do this book club the Sharon says so on Instagram I don't know if you know her but I do her book club and I for, turns out it wasn't just me like when she posted the book for last semester that we were reading for some reason the link went to the large font and so it came and all these people were like, oh, I have this, lar- I ordered the large font version, but it was magical. I was like, can I get these from the library? Like, am I old enough to be <laughs> taking the good, like new books from the large print section of the library? I don't know. <laughs> I'm telling you, it makes a huge difference when you don't have to have those glasses. I'm like, oh. and so that's what I ask for everybody for Christmas. I'm like, just give me Amazon gift cards so I can buy more books. That's all I want. That's all I, I want for it. Christmas. I love it. It's been so good talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on and for partnering with us this season. And it's always good to see you and catch up. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And it's been an honor. Thank you so much. Bye. Anytime.